Hello guys and welcome to another calculus video. Today we're going to be taking a little bit more of a laid back video. Um, something for my viewers who maybe aren't so well versed in all these uh, special functions and cool math concepts. We're going to be talking about how to define the gamma function and its analytic continuation. So if you're already very familiar with it, feel free to click off. But if you're interested in learning more, uh, I advise you to watch. So Let's jump right into it. So, as you saw on the last slide, this was the definition of the gamma function. Oh, I'm sorry. Gamma of x equals the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the x minus 1 e to the negative t dt. Now, the first thing that we're going to show is that this is also equal to x minus 1 factorial for x is greater than or equal to 1 and x is an integer. Right? So what we're going to do is we're going to first consider gamma of x plus 1. This is equal to the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the x e to the negative t dt. Next, we're going to do integration by parts. So we're going to integrate e to the negative t, and that's going to look like negative e to the negative t, and we're going to keep t to the x the same, and we're going to evaluate at infinity at 0. At infinity, exponentials decay much more quickly than polynomials, you can verify this just using the Hopedal's rule repeatedly, but this is going to go to 0. And at 0, t to the x is just 0 because t is 0, so it's just all 0, right? So overall, this goes to 0. Then we're going to be adding the integral because of this negative sign right here. Usually, we'd be subtracting the integral from 0 to infinity of the derivative with respect to t of t to the x, which is x t to the x minus 1 e to the negative t dt. We can bring this x outside because x is not dependent on t. And so, if you look at this right here, gamma of x plus 1 is going to be equal to x gamma of x. Now note that this is only going to be valid for uh, these numbers of z. Well, actually, it doesn't matter about the x being an integer part, but as long as x is greater than or equal to 0, this is going to be valid because otherwise, this t to the x term at 0 is going to be infinity, and so that's going to cause a lot of problems. So this is only valid for certain values. Now if we plug in gamma of 1, that's just the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative t. Basic calc bc integral, it just evaluates to 1. Then, using our functional equation, we can calculate gamma of any other positive integer. So let's start with gamma of 2. That's going to be just 1 times gamma of 1, which is 1. Gamma of 3 is going to be 2 times gamma of 2, which is 2. Gamma of 4 is going to be 3 times gamma of 3, which is 6. And as you can see, as we go on, it's just going to keep following this pattern of factorial. So as you can see, this is accurate. Now what I want to talk about is uh, how we can define it for numbers that aren't positive integers. So let's go ahead and uh, move to another slide. So here, what I'm drawing is called the complex plane. And so this is a way that we can represent complex numbers, all the complex numbers, on just a single plane. So most of you are hopefully already familiar with this. You know, we just have the imaginary axis and the real axis right here, negative numbers over here, negative imaginary numbers. And just using Cartesian coordinates, we can represent any number we want. Now, I'm going to be uh, drawing in different colors to show where we can and can't define the gamma function. So first, we've already defined it for positive integers. So I'll write that in, in uh, red right here. All right. Now we want to be able to extend it to all real numbers. So or to, to basically everywhere that we can in the complex plane. So the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the x minus 1 e to the negative t dt. Clearly, this diverges if x is 0, because we have that t to the negative 1 at 0. However, for large x, um, it'll clearly converge, because e to the negative t uh, decreases dramatically as t gets large, right? And so basically, this is going to be defined for any x is greater than 0, because at x equals 0, we have the t to the negative 1, which is problematic. But for any x greater than 0, we'll have t to the something that's greater than negative 1. 
and we know that that integral will converge, and we don't have to worry about it converging at infinity because of the e to the negative t. So overall, I'll put a big circle around zero because we can't define it there. And I'll color in the rest of the real axis here. All right, and obviously we can't define it for negative numbers either because that would diverge even more. Now let's try and extend it to the complex numbers. Remember that e to the ix equals cosine of x plus i sine of x. If we replace x with ln x, we'll get cosine of ln x plus i sine of ln x, right? And of course, e to the ln x is just x, so overall this is x to the i. So if we wanted to find some gamma of a plus bi, we can actually do this using Euler's formula right here. So we're going to end up with the integral from 0 to infinity of t to the a minus 1, e to the negative t, and then using that imaginary part, the bi part, we'll end up with um, cosine of b ln x plus i sine of that, you know, same thing, dt. And so clearly, I'm not aware of any complex numbers for which, or any numbers with imaginary parts for which we can calculate an exact value of gamma of that, of, of gamma. But I know that, you know, you can use a calculator and it'll do some massive Riemann sum and it will be able to evaluate both the real and imaginary parts of those integrals. So we can kind of extend our definition to all the complex numbers for which, as you can see right here, a still has to be greater than zero. So we can extend it to anything right here, excluding the imaginary axis, because there a is equal to zero, and so that doesn't work. Now we're going to do what's called analytic continuation. Analytic continuation is something that we do for complex or real functions, I suppose. That is basically, we take a functional equation that works for some domain of that function, and then we assume that it's going to work everywhere. What ends up happening is we're going to be able to define the gamma function nearly everywhere, even where this integral doesn't diverge. So what that looks like is we're going to use this formula that we derived earlier, gamma of x plus 1 equals x gamma of x. If we rearrange this, we can say that gamma of x equals gamma of x plus 1 over x. And this allows us to define the gamma function nearly everywhere. For example, you want to calculate gamma of i? Well, even though the integral diverges, it's just gamma of i plus 1 over i, which we know that this converges, and we know that this is just a number, so this is defined. You can do this for any number on the imaginary axis, so we'll go ahead and fill that in now. And, of course, you can also do this for any imaginary number with a negative part because there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to, right? It's basically the same thing. You know, once I have gamma of i, I can calculate gamma of i minus 1, or I can calculate ga gamma of i minus half, minus 1 half, because I have gamma of i plus 1 half. And so we can kind of, anywhere we, where we have a value, we can kind of jump one over. We have a value, we can jump one over. And so we're going to be able to define everything here. Now, interestingly, the part where this gets a little bit sketchy is actually when we're trying to define it on the real numbers. And the reason for that is if we try to calculate, say, gamma of 0, we're going to end up with gamma of 1, which is totally normal, over 0. So that doesn't work because we have a, a number over 0, so we still won't be able to define it at gamma of 0. Similarly, we can't define it at negative 1 because that requires us calculating gamma of 0 first, which we can't do. So at every negative integer, negative real integer, we're going to have um, a bit of a pole or something that's not completely defined, right? So we can't define it there. But for everywhere else, for example, since we have uh, values right here, we can kind of shift them over and we can calculate the values here, we can calculate the values here. So we can calculate anything that isn't either 0 or a negative integer. So I'll go ahead and fill that in. And so overall, you can see how using analytic continuation, we can define the gamma function nearly everywhere. Now, there's just two more things I want to discuss, and then we'll wrap up this video on the gamma function.
The other things that we have to know about the gamma function are gamma function of half numbers, so that means, for example, gamma of one half, and the Euler's gamma identity. So for example, if we want to calculate gamma of one half, this is going to be the integral from zero to infinity of t to the negative one half, e to the negative t, dt. Or if we write t to the negative one half as one over square root t. Now, if we substitute u equals square root t, we'll end up with u squared equals t dt equals 2u du, so we'll end up with 2 times the integral from 0 to infinity of e to the negative u squared du. Now I'm not going to derive this result on, the, on this video because it's been proved several hundreds of times by hundreds of different people. You can find it basically anywhere, but this is just square root pi over 2. And so overall, this answer is just going to be square root pi, and that's gamma of 1 half. So using this, and using the uh, functional equation for the gamma function, we can calculate gamma of negative 1 half. We can calculate gamma of 3 halves, 5 halves, 7 halves, negative 3 halves, anything like that. So there actually is a general formula that someone has made for gamma of x plus 1 half. So overall, this is pretty cool. Um, interestingly, the integers and the um, integers plus minus 1 half is actually the only place where we can define the gamma function with an exact value, uh, as far as I know. Uh, there may be other ones, but I'm not, I'm not aware of that. And so basically, we don't know the exact value for gamma of 1 -third or gamma of 1 -sixth, and we just have an approximation from a calculator. Now, the last thing I want to go over is something that's going to be really useful for doing integrals or infinite series or whatever it is you want to use the, the gamma function for. That's called Euler's reflection identity. Again, I'm not going to be proving it because it's a little bit complicated, but it basically says that gamma of z, I'm using z because this works very well for complex variables, times gamma of 1 minus z equals pi cosecant of pi z. And so that's just a really good formula to know because it pops up all over the place. I've used it myself in many different situations. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, if you didn't know much about the gamma function, I'm hoping you're an expert by now. And I'll see you in other videos. Yeah, hope you enjoyed. See you in another video. Bye.